The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part One, Chapter Twelve. They now began the descent of the mountain. Climbing down the crater, they went round the cone and reached their encampment of the previous night. Pencroft thought it must be breakfast time, and the watches of the reporter and engineer were therefore consulted to find out the hour. That of Gideon Spilett had been preserved from the sea water, as he had been thrown at once on the sand out of reach of the waves. It was an instrument of excellent quality, a perfect pocket chronometer, which the reporter had not forgotten to wind up carefully every day. As to the engineer's watch, it, of course, had stopped during the time which he had passed on the downs. The engineer now wound it up, and, ascertaining by the height of the sun that it must be about nine o'clock in the morning, he put his watch at that hour. "'No, my dear Spilett, wait. You have kept the Richmond time, have you not?' "'Yes, Cyrus. Consequently, your watch is set by the meridian of that town, which is almost that of Washington?' Undoubtedly. Very well, keep it thus. Content yourself with winding it up very exactly, but do not touch the hands. This may be of use to us. Well, what will be the good of that? thought the sailor. They ate, and so heartily, that the store of game and almonds was totally exhausted. But Pencroft was not at all uneasy. They would supply themselves on the way. Top, whose share had been very much to his taste, would know how to find some fresh game among the brushwood. Moreover, the sailor thought of simply asking the engineer to manufacture some powder and one or two fowling pieces. He supposed there would be no difficulty in that. On leaving the plateau, the captain proposed to his companions to return to the chimneys by a new way. He wished to reconnoitre Lake Grant, so magnificently framed in trees. They therefore followed the crest of one of the spurs between which the creek that supplied the lake probably had its source. In talking, the settlers already employed the names which they had just chosen, which singularly facilitated the exchange of their ideas. Herbert and Pencroft, the one young and the other very boyish, were enchanted, and while walking the sailor said, "'Hey, Herbert, how capital it sounds! It will be impossible to lose ourselves, my boy, since whether we follow the way to Lake Grant, or whether we join the Mercy through the woods of the far west, we shall be certain to arrive at Prospect Heights, and consequently at Union Bay. It had been agreed that without forming a compact band, the settlers should not stray away from each other. It was very certain that the thick forests of the island were inhabited by dangerous animals, and it was prudent to be on their guard. In general, Pencroft, Herbert, and Neb walked first, preceded by Top, who poked his nose into every bush. The reporter and the engineer went together, Gideon Spilett ready to note every incident, the engineer silent for the most part, and only stepping aside to pick up, one thing or another, a mineral or vegetable substance, which he put into his pocket without making any remark. "'What can he be picking up?' muttered Pencroft. I have looked in vain for anything that's worth the trouble of stooping for." Towards ten o'clock the little band descended the last declivities of Mount Franklin. As yet the ground was scantily strewn with bushes and trees. They were walking over yellowish calcinated earth, forming a plain of nearly a mile long, which extended to the edge of the wood. Great blocks of that basalt which, according to Bischoff, takes three hundred and fifty millions of years to cool, strewed the plain, very confused in some places. However, there were here no traces of lava, which was spread more particularly over the northern slopes. Cyrus Harding expected to reach, without incident, the course of the creek, which he supposed flowed under the trees at the border of the plain, when he saw Herbert running hastily back, while Neb and the sailor were hiding behind the rocks. "'What's the matter, my boy?' asked Spilett. "'Smoke!' replied Herbert. "'We have seen smoke among the rocks, a hundred paces from us.' "'Men in this place!' cried the reporter. "'We must avoid showing ourselves before knowing with whom we have to deal,' replied Cyrus Harding. "'I trust that there are no natives on this island.' I dread them more than anything else. Where is Top?" 
Top is on before. And he doesn't bark? No. That is strange. However, we must try to call him back. In a few moments, the engineer, Gideon Spilett, and Herbert had rejoined their two companions, and like them they kept out of sight behind the heaps of basalt. From thence they clearly saw smoke of a yellowish colour rising in the air. Top was recalled by a slight whistle from his master, and the latter, signing to his companions to wait for him, glided away among the rocks. The colonists, motionless, anxiously awaited the results of this exploration, when a shout from the engineer made them hasten forward. They soon joined him and were at once struck with a disagreeable odour which impregnated the atmosphere. The odour, easily recognised, was enough for the engineer to guess what the smoke was which at first, not without cause, had startled him. "'This fire,' said he, "'or rather this smoke is produced by nature alone. There is a sulphur spring there, which will cure all our sore throats.' "'Captain!' cried Pencroft. What a pity that I haven't got a cold!" The settlers then directed their steps toward the place from which the smoke escaped. They there saw a sulphur spring which flowed abundantly between the rocks, and its waters discharged a strong sulphuric acid odor, after having absorbed the oxygen of the air. Cyrus Harding, dipping in his hand, felt the water oily to the touch. He tasted it, and found it rather sweet. As to its temperature, that he estimated at ninety-five degrees Fahrenheit. Herbert having asked on what he based this calculation, "'It's quite simple, my boy,' said he, for, in plunging my hand into the water, I felt no sensation either of heat or cold. Therefore it has the same temperature as the human body, which is about ninety-five degrees.' The sulphur spring, not being of any actual use to the settlers, they proceeded towards the thick border of the forest, which began some hundred paces off. There, as they had conjectured, the waters of the stream flowed clear and limpid between high banks of red earth, the colour of which betrayed the presence of oxide of iron. From this colour the name of Red Creek was immediately given to the watercourse. It was only a large stream, deep and clear, formed of the mountain water which, half river, half torrent, here rippling peacefully over the sand, there chafing against the rocks or dashing down in a cascade, ran towards the lake, over a distance of a mile and a half, its breadth varying from thirty to forty feet. Its waters were sweet, and it was supposed that those of the lake were so also. A fortunate circumstance, in the event of their finding on its borders a more suitable dwelling than the chimneys. As to the trees, which some hundred feet downwards shaded the banks of the creek, they belonged, for the most part, to the species which abound in the temperate zone of America and Tasmania, and no longer to those coniferae observed in that portion of the island already explored to some miles from Prospect Heights. At this time of the year, the commencement of the month of April, which represents the month of October in this hemisphere, that is, the beginning of autumn, they were still in full leaf. They consisted principally of casuarinas and eucalypti, some of which next year would yield a sweet manna, similar to the manna of the east. Clumps of Australian cedars rose on the sloping banks, which were also covered with a high grass called tussack in New Holland. But the coconut, so abundant in the archipelagos of the Pacific, seemed to be wanting in the island, the latitude doubtless being too low. "'What a pity!' said Herbert. "'Such a useful tree, and which is such beautiful nuts!' As to the birds, they swarmed among the scanty branches of the eucalypti and casuarinas, which did not hinder the display of their wings black, white, or grey cockatoos, parakeets, with plumage of all colours, kingfishers of a sparkling green and crowned with red, blue lorries, and various other birds appeared on all sides, as through a prism, fluttering about and producing a deafening clamour. Suddenly 
a strange concert of discordant voices resounded in the midst of a thicket. The settlers heard successfully the song of birds, the cry of quadrupeds, and a sort of clacking which they might have believed to have escaped from the lips of a native. Neb and Herbert rushed towards the bush, forgetting even the most elementary principles of prudence. Happily, they found there neither a formidable wild beast nor a dangerous native, but merely half a dozen mocking and singing birds, known as mountain pheasants. A few skilful blows from a stick soon put an end to their concert, and procured excellent food for the evening's dinner. Herbert also discovered some magnificent pigeons with bronzed wings, some superbly crested, some draped in green, like their congeners at Port Macquarie. But it was impossible to reach them, or the crows and magpies which flew away in flocks. A charge of small shot would have made great slaughter among these birds, but the hunters were still limited to sticks and stones, and these primitive weapons proved very insufficient. Their insufficiency was still more clearly shown when a troop of quadrupeds, jumping, bounding, making leaps of thirty feet, regular flying mammiferae, fled over the thickets so quickly and at such a height that one would have thought that they passed from one tree to another like squirrels. Kangaroos! cried Herbert. Are they good to eat? asked Pencroft. Stewed, replied the reporter. Their flesh is equal to the best venison. Gideon Spilett had not finished this exciting sentence when the sailor, followed by Neb and Herbert, darted on the kangaroo's tracks. Cyrus Harding called them back in vain. But it was in vain, too, for the hunters to pursue such agile game, which went bounding away like balls. After a chase of five minutes they lost their breath, and at the same time all sight of the creatures, which disappeared in the wood. Top was not more successful than his masters. Captain, said Pencroft, when the engineer and the reporter had rejoined them, Captain, you see quite well, we can't get on unless we make a few guns. Will that be possible? Perhaps, replied the engineer, but we will begin by first manufacturing some bows and arrows, and I don't doubt that you will become as clever in the use of them as the Australian hunters. Bows and arrows, said Pencroft scornfully, that's all very well for children. Don't be proud, Fred Pencroft, replied the reporter. Bows and arrows were sufficient for centuries to stain the earth with blood. Powder is but a thing of yesterday, and war is as old as the human race, unhappily. Faith, that's true, Mr. Spilett, replied the sailor, and I always speak too quickly. You must excuse me. Meanwhile Herbert, constant to his favorite science, natural history, reverted to the kangaroos, saying, Besides, we had to deal just now with the species which is most difficult to catch. They were giants with long grey fur, but if I am not mistaken, there exist black and red kangaroos, rock kangaroos, and rat kangaroos, which are more easy to get hold of. It is reckoned that there are about a dozen species. Herbert, replied the sailor sententiously, there is only one species of kangaroo to me, that is, kangaroo on the spit, and it's just the one we haven't got this evening. They could not help laughing at Master Pencroft's new classification. The honest sailor did not hide his regret at being reduced for dinner to the singing pheasants, but fortune once more showed itself obliging to him. In fact, Top, who felt that his interest was concerned, went and ferreted everywhere with an instinct doubled by a ferocious appetite. It was even probable that if some piece of game did fall into his clutches, none would be left for the hunters, if Top was hunting on his own account. But Neb watched him, and he did well. Towards three o'clock the dog disappeared in the brushwood, and gruntings showed that he was engaged in a struggle with some animal. Neb rushed after him, and soon saw Top eagerly devouring a quadruped, which ten seconds later would have been past recognizing in Top's stomach. But fortunately the dog had fallen upon a brood, and besides the victim he was devouring, two other rodents, the animals in question belonged to that order, lay strangled on the turf. 
Neb reappeared triumphantly holding one of the rodents in each hand. Their size exceeded that of a rabbit, their hair was yellow, mingled with green spots, and they had the merest rudiments of tails. The citizens of the Union were at no loss for the right name of these rodents. They were maras, a sort of agouti, a little larger than their congeners of tropical countries, regular American rabbits, with long ears, jaws armed on each side with five molars, which distinguished the agouti. Hurrah! cried Pencroft. The roast has arrived, and now we can go home. The walk, interrupted for an instant, was resumed. The limpid waters of the Red Creek flowed under an arch of casuarinas, banksias, and gigantic gum-trees. Superb lilacs rose to a height of twenty feet. Other aborescent species, unknown to the young naturalist, bent over the stream, which could be heard murmuring beneath the bowers of verdure. Meanwhile the stream grew much wider, and Cyrus Harding supposed that they would soon reach its mouth. In fact, on emerging from beneath a thick clump of beautiful trees, it suddenly appeared before their eyes. The explorers had arrived on the western shore of Lake Grant. The place was well worth looking at. This extent of water, of a circumference of nearly seven miles, and an area of two hundred and fifty acres, reposed in a border of diversified trees. Towards the east, through a curtain of verdure, picturesquely raised in some places, sparkled an horizon of sea. The lake was curved at the north, which contrasted with the sharp outline of its lower part. Numerous aquatic birds frequented the shores of this little Ontario, in which the thousand isles of its American namesake were represented by a rock which emerged from its surface some hundred feet from the southern shore. There lived in harmony several couples of kingfishers, perched on a stone, grave, motionless, watching for fish, then darting down, they plunged in with a sharp cry, and reappeared with their prey in their beaks. On the shores, and on the islets, strutted wild ducks, pelicans, water-hens, red beaks, philodons, furnished with a tongue like a brush, and one or two specimens of the splendid manura the tail of which expands gracefully like a lyre. As to the water of the lake, it was sweet, limpid, rather dark, and from certain bubblings, and the concentric circles which crossed each other on the surface, it could not be doubted that it abounded in fish. "'This lake is really beautiful,' said Gideon Spilett. "'We could live on its borders.' "'We will live there,' replied Harding. The settlers, wishing to return to the chimneys by the shortest way, descended towards the angle formed on the south by the junction of the lake's bank. It was not without difficulty that they broke a path through the thickets and brushwood which had never been put aside by the hand of man, and they thus went towards the shore, so as to arrive at the north of Prospect Heights. Two miles were cleared in this direction and then, after they had passed the last curtain of trees, appeared the plateau, carpeted with thick turf, and beyond that, the infinite sea. To return to the chimneys, it was enough to cross the plateau obliquely for the space of a mile, and then to descend to the elbow formed by the first detour of the Mercy. But the engineer desired to know how and where the overplus of the water from the lake escaped and the exploration was prolonged under the trees for a mile and a half towards the north. It was most probable that an overfall existed somewhere, and doubtless through a cleft in the granite. This lake was only, in short, an immense center basin, which was filled by degrees by the creek, and its waters must necessarily pass to the sea by some fall. If it was so, the engineer thought that it might perhaps be possible to utilize this fall and borrow its power, actually lost without profit to anyone. They continued then to follow the shores of Lake Grant by climbing the plateau, but after having gone a mile in this direction, Cyrus Harding had not been able to discover the overfall, which, however, must exist somewhere. It was then half-past four. 
In order to prepare for dinner it was necessary that the settlers should return to their dwelling. The little band retraced their steps, therefore, and by the left bank of the Mercy Cyrus Harding and his companions arrived at the chimneys. The fire was lighted, and Neb and Pencroft, on whom the functions of cooks naturally devolved, to the one in his quality of negro, to the other in that of sailor, quickly prepared some broiled agouti, to which they did great justice. The repast at length terminated. At the moment when each one was about to give himself up to sleep, Cyrus Harding drew from his pocket little specimens of different sorts of minerals, and just said, "'My friends, this is iron mineral, this a pyrite, this is clay, this is lime, and this is coal. Nature gives us these things. It is our business to make a right use of them. Tomorrow we will commence operations.'" End of chapter.